continuing. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and welcome to tonight's Credit Club debate. Uh, to maintain the spirit of this occasion, we ask that people not distribute flyers uh, that are not from the Credit Club throughout the crowd. Speak up, please. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, if you are offered such a flyer, please do not accept it or pass it on. The Socratic Club was founded to provide a forum for the discussion of the intellectual difficulties connected with religion and Christianity in particular. Our goal is to provide the OSU community with a venue for philosophical discussion and engaging debate. In doing so, we hope to maintain the long-standing tradition of free dialogue in a genuine variety of ideas. Tonight's debate will be separated into three sections. First, each speaker will present opening remarks for 20 minutes. Following this, we'll, we will allow each speaker time to cross-examine and question each other over their positions. Lastly, we will open the debate uh, to questions from the audience. Uh, so please refrain from speaking until that time. This evening's debate is entitled, Is Tolerance More Important Than Truth? Do truth and tolerance inevitably conflict with one another? Does respect for others mean that all religions and philosophies are true? Does a diversity of points of view prove that there is no such thing as truth? How can Christianity insist that it is true in the face of other religions and philosophies making competing claims? Or do all religions ultimately teach the same thing? Our speakers will explore these issues and offer divergent views. Our first speaker is Reverend Martin Emmerich. Dr. Emmerich is currently the pastor of Westminster Presbyterian Church here in Corvallis. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Law from the University of Frankfurt in Germany and a Master's of Divinity from Westminster Seminary in Escondido, California and a PhD in Biblical Hermeneutics from Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. He is the author of Pneumatological Concepts in the Epistle to the Hebrews and several articles. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Mark Nemmerich. Good evening. Let me see whether I have my microphone on here. I do. Good evening, my name is Martin Emmerich, and I have a rather simple design for this talk tonight. We will spend quite a bit of time talking about the intersection of truth and tolerance. First, I shall speak of truth and show how it presupposes tolerance by its very nature. Then, turning to tolerance, I hopefully will make a case for tolerance not being able to operate in a moral vacuum, but tolerance is a need of truth to define its limits. And finally, the question, is tolerance more important than truth, which I do not at all like, but we will get to this as well. I will attempt to answer it, at least in a provisional way. Now, as for truth, I wish I had more time. But we do live in a world whose philosophical foundations deny us access to the concept of truth conceived in an objective or even absolute sense. Alastair McIntyre, Richard Rorty, Michael Polanyi, Leslie Newbigin, to mention just a few names, belong to the guild of thinkers who maintain that truth and meaning are not universal and not transcendent, but are the product of cultural conventions. Language, it is claimed, human language, uh, does not represent reality or truth and in its very nature cannot do so. It is constituting reality and truth as well. So, reality and truth are a social construct. 
We live in our own linguistic world, our linguistic conventions, and we have no way of getting out of our own world uh, to know the way things really are, the, the, the nature of things, the true nature of things. And still, we keep talking about it, and even those who claim that there is no such thing as universal truth will help themselves to just enough of it to build their case. Now, to be sure, human language is arbitrary, and is highly arbitrary. Why do we call an apple an apple? Why not orange or pillow? The French call apple pomme and the Germans call it apfel. But neither one has or can construct an argument based on logic that will tell us precisely that it has to be this way. Human language is highly arbitrary and it is bound up in cultural conventions. Uh, Postmodern thought has rendered an invaluable service in uh, insisting on the fact that we are local and that we are uh, bound up in our linguistic conventions. We are we're living in a linguistic world of our own making. And this is true. But it does not follow that we are ill-equipped, or I should say that we are unable to get outside of our own world and to say something or to know something about the true nature of things. Once again, if you think of yourself as living in a box and you've never been able to get outside of your box, how would you know that you are, in fact, living in a box? You could only make this claim on the basis of more comprehensive knowledge one that transcends life in the miserable, stuffy box. All the same, based on our sociological and uh, historical and uh, uh, social um, um, uh, conditioning, many would argue that it is impossible to judge the rightness or the wrongness of competing beliefs in the public marketplace. You may call them truths. Epistemological and moral subjectivity also results from a most unfortunate habit in Western society. We say that we live in a pluralistic society, and as I look around, I can only say that's true. I myself am living proof for it because I joined this nation rather late in the game. I grew up in a foreign nation. Now I'm here. And we do live in a pluralistic society. But here's the problem. Pluralism is a descriptive term. It tells you how things are. It tells you uh, or it represents the status quo. Pluralism, however, has turned into or has been exalted to the level of a moral ideal. Now it is no longer descriptive, but pluralism is telling you how things ought to be. It is a prescriptive term. Pluralism comes closest in its use, in, in our conventional uh, way of speaking, uh, to relativism. The slogan of our time is, I am okay. <coughs> you are okay. But just because we have diversity and a diversity of views as a sociological fact, it does not follow that none of them are uniquely right or that none of them are uniquely wrong. Ethical relativism in its final consequence doesn't even work. When we are left to personal values colliding in the public square. In that case, to use the words of Thomas Hobbes, life would be nasty and brutish and rather short. I love the word brutish. <laughs> but there are many who are far more optimistic. Bruce Ackerman, for example, 
is firmly convinced that we should not only refrain from indoctrinating each other in one vision or version of the truth uh, rather than another, but that competing agendas can still be discussed in what he calls an atmosphere of neutral dialogue. Neutral dialogue proceeds or functions in a moral vacuum in which the interlocutors do not hold anything but subjective opinions. They are then thrown into a pool and then you pick and choose which one of these opinions make for prosperity or make for stability or anything that you wish to accomplish. Ackerman's concept of neutral dialogue even extends to the realm of parental authority, which at his hands is reshaped in terms of providing gentle guidance and um, kind suggestions, but never ever making any moral demands on your child after the age of five. Or is it three? I think it is three. And Ackerman is um, uh, honest enough to acknowledge this is arbitrary as well. But the goal is to protect the child from uh, the, the linguistic power play of human society which has mastered in the art of indoctrinating people and producing clones of its own images. And this is true of our society or any human society, I would argue, as well. The goal, Ackerman would claim, is to be as free as possible from any trace of human tradition so as to learn to make wise decisions. And when you reach adulthood, you will then reinvent the concept of wisdom and moral truth for yourself, each one for himself. Becoming a truly mature human being is the motto. But on that note, one could imagine a dialogue which I have lifted from Bodzizewski, a dialogue between a father and his son. Bear with me. The son says, ah, I think I'll go rip off Eddie's bike. What will Eddie think if he sees you riding around on his bicycle? Nothing. It looks like a thousand other bikes. All the same, you shouldn't take it, son. That would be stealing. Yeah, I know. So what? I'm as good as he is. And he is as good as you are. You do not seem to have much respect for your fellow citizen. I have plenty of respect for him. Uh, because he is as entitled to try and stop me as I am to try and take his bike if he sees me. <laughs> Sorry, I just can't let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> 